welcome. I've just been informed we have 83 participants as of about two seconds ago, so um, I'm absolutely thrilled with that. Uh, so let me start. Good afternoon, uh, and thank you for joining us at the Ohio Transfer Council's first remote meeting. My name is Donna Geraci, and I'm the president this year of the Ohio Transfer Council. I will tell you, this is not the annual conference that we originally planned. But then, this isn't the spring semester that our colleges or universities planned either. We are all adapting and changing to meet the needs of the unique situation in which we find ourselves. Those of you who are current OTC members are likely already aware of this, but the executive board voted unanimously to extend your membership by one year at no charge. We know the financial challenges that your institutions are experiencing because our colleges and universities are experiencing them as well. We wanted to make it as easy as possible for you to continue your OTC involvement. We also want to encourage others to connect with OTC. So we've taken the unprecedented step of offering a free one-year limited membership for non-members in the transfer profession. What do we mean by limited? This is the fine print. If your organization isn't already an OTC member institution, your incoming and outgoing transfer students won't be able to will be eligible to apply for the 2020 David Gall Memorial Scholarship. The limited membership will, however, include access to the upcoming professional development opportunities that we'll be offering throughout this summer and into the academic year. And you'll hear a little bit more about that later. If we were all together at Ohio Wesleyan University, as originally planned, this is the point when I would ask the executive board members to join me on stage for introductions and for appreciation. That's not possible today, but please let me introduce the current executive board remotely. Um, Ted McCown from Kent State is our president-elect. Ted will be the president beginning in July. Be nice to him now. Um, Sarah Unger from Miami University is our past president. Susan Reif from Heidelberg is our treasurer. Mary Witt from Columbus State is our treasurer-elect. Mary will step into the treasurer role in July. Barbara Miller-Harris from Kent State is our secretary. Craig Soule from Capital University is the chair of the recruitment committee. Craig will be stepping down at the end of June, but he's already working with Amanda Means from Shawnee State to prepare her to take over the chair position in July. Chaka Wilson from The Ohio State University and Jason Gibson from Lorraine Community College are the chair and co-chair of the scholarship committee. Deb Heisel from North Central State College and Hideo Toshida from the University of Dayton are the chair and co-chair of the events and professional uh, development committee. Jonathan Gates, formerly of the University of Akron and now at Kent State, is the communication committee chair. He is also the man behind the screen um, helping manage all of this today. So thank you very much, Jonathan. I am extremely grateful for this amazing group of people who in the midst of COVID-19 and challenges at their own institutions, continue to show up at Zoom meetings to help craft the Ohio Transfer Council's path forward. Special thanks to Deb and Hideo who nimbly moved from planning an in-person conference to today's Zoom event. Applause is tricky on a Zoom meeting, especially since we've muted you all, but if I had my way, there would be a standing ovation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I also want to share with you a little bit about our election results. Uh, thank you to all of you who nominated people for the elected board positions. I am pleased to announce the following new board members. President-elect is Melissa Swafford from Cuyahoga Community College. The secretary will be Robin Marufo from the University of Toledo. And treasurer-elect Allison Tracy from Bowling Green State University. Melissa, Robin, and Allison, welcome to the Ohio Transfer Council Executive Board. I look forward to working with you. Jonathan likely looks forward to receiving your pictures so that he can update our webpage by the end of June. 
So every year at the annual conference, we provide a printout of, the, of our financial statement. This year, it's been emailed to each of you. Please look it over at your leisure and let us know if you have any questions. We'd be happy to answer them. Um, as you're likely aware, typically the conference is our main source of revenue and we don't have that this year, but that's okay. We're, uh, we're gonna make it work. Don't worry, we're still a very strong and stable organization. So um, moving on to the awards. At this point in the program, I would normally be holding a stack of awards to present to particularly noteworthy uh, OTC members. There would be handshakes and photo opportunities and absolutely no social distancing. This year, I can only tell you about these award-winning members and ask that they email us a photo of themselves holding their award when it arrives in the mail. And for some people, it may have arrived before you knew you were getting this award, and I, I do apologize for that. The award company was particularly speedy. Our new member award recognizes significant contributions to the OTC by a member with fewer than five years in the transfer profession. This year's recipient, during her first year at the University of Akron, helped build a better enrollment process for transfers, adults, and military students transitioning to UA. She's also taken part in larger capacities, helping out with ODHE projects and the Northeastern Ohio Summit Grant Group. Not many people can make such a large impact in such a short time in the field. But this individual has made transferring in Northeast Ohio a much more refined process. OTC is pleased to present the new member award to Marianne Stawila. Congratulations and cheers. The Tom Vandermeulen Award recognizes an individual whose contributions have led to the enhancement of relations among people of diverse cultures, ethnic groups, first-generation college students, or students with special needs. This year's recipient has worked for nearly 10 years in the areas of workforce development, admission, and advising. While at Columbus State, she helped create and advise the Scholar Network, a group of students transitioning out of foster care. She mentored other staff and students through groups at Columbus State and consistently advocated for students who were often ignored. Several of her mentees are now pursuing master degrees and beyond and still remain in touch. This individual, now at The Ohio State University, is also a strong member of the community where she and other members of her family teach step and hip hop at a local community center. OTC is pleased to present the Tom Vandermeulen Award to Chaka Wilson. Congratulations, Chaka. Pause for applause. Uh, the Jonathan Toffel Award is the highest honor that OTC can bestow on an individual. The criteria used to select recipients includes service and education to the OTC, contributions to the profession of transfer student services, and qualities such as humility, professionalism, dedication, fairness, and unselfishness. In addition, this award recognizes significant participation and contributions to the activities of the OTC, as well as long and meritorious service in our profession. This year's recipient of the Jonathan Toffel Award has dedicated her professional career to the transfer student population. With over 30 years in admissions at Capital University, this individual has impacted the lives of thousands of transfer students and has been an advocate for this often underserved population. She works tirelessly days and nights and weekends to ensure her students are receiving the support and information needed for a smooth transition to capital. This individual attends national confer conferences and workshops every year to learn about best practices for the transfer student population. She's also served as a leader in Capital's current collaboration with Columbus State through the Gardner Institute's Foundations of Excellence. Her leadership and guidance are major factors in developing more equitable policies and support systems for Capital University's transfer student population. 
This individual has also been a member of the Ohio Transfer Council for many years and has served as committee chair for recruitment and communication. She's a regular attendee of OTC's conferences and workshops and serves as a mentor to young professionals entering the field. I am very pleased to announce this year's recipient for the Jonathan Toffel Award is Deanna Bond from Capital University. Congratulations, Deanna. One last thing before I hand the virtual microphone off to Deb. These are challenging times, but with challenge comes opportunity. And here at the Ohio Transfer Council, we found new ways of doing things. Let's face it, we really didn't have uh, much choice now, did we? Um, as is the case for, for our universities and colleges. OTC has always been committed to enhancing the transfer process for students between member institutions. We provide a forum for transfer professionals to generate and to share ideas, to understand and to develop transfer policies and procedures, and to offer opportunities for networking and for personal growth. The Ohio Transfer Council remains committed to those ideals. We're just finding new ways to deliver on our promises. I hope that next year finds us together somewhere in the Columbus area, networking in person at the 2021 annual conference. But if circumstances should prevent that, I am confident that OTC will still be a vibrant and active organization, still dedicated to transfers, and transfer professionals and still working together. Thank you for all that you do for your students, for your institutions, and for OTC. And now I ask Deb to take over for the professional development portion of today's meeting. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Donna. I appreciate um, your kind welcome to our portion of the program. First, I will explain a little bit about how the program is going to be arranged, the panel, and then I will introduce our panelists. And we do have a great panel today for you. The uh, first 30 minutes of the panel presentation will be questions directed to the panelists. And then the last 15 minutes will be moderated by Jonathan Gates of Kent State, our communication manager. And as uh, Donna has already said, the person behind the screens here today. So what I would like you to do, if you have questions, please enter them in the chat uh, box and if we have time, uh, Jonathan will direct those to the panelists, all of the questions, but if there are some that we do not have time to address today, then we will, uh, we will uh, post the answers on our website uh, in the near future. We will also follow up today's uh, session with sending out some additional information uh, particularly from ODHE. So now if you would, thank you so much, Jonathan. The, this, is, these, this is our panel participants. They represent a range of institutions, a range of experience, and I'm really grateful to all of them for coming forward today to share their experience with us. From Cuyahoga Community College, we have Katie Bradford. She is a transfer specialist. We have from, Dr. from ODHE and the Articulation and Transfer uh, Center, we have the Associate Vice Chancellor for Articulation and Transfer, Dr. Paula Compton. We have Donna Garacy, who is representing uh, the interests of registrar. She is an assistant registrar at Xavier University. We have uh, me moderating. Uh, we have Jared Shank, also from ODHE, the Senior Director of Military and Apprenticeship Initiatives and Special Projects. Sorry, I was covering on my screen. Uh, Jesse Spencer is joining us also from ODHE. She is the Director of Articulation and Transfer Policy, Budget and Constituent Relations. We have Sarah Unger from Miami University. She is the Senior Assistant Director of transfer and relocation initiatives. We have Mary Witt, 
who is the Transfer and Articulation Coordinator at Columbus State Community College. And we have Shaka Wilson. She is the Columbus State Advising Specialist at Ohio State University, The Ohio State University. And she manages the strong partner partnership, transfer partnership between Columbus State and Ohio State. So those are our panelists and you can, as you can tell, they really do have different interests in transfer. And I want to say thank you too, to all of our audience participants, because I know that to bring you here on a Friday for transfer, uh, you have a deep interest in transfer and making it stronger in the state of Ohio. So I truly appreciate that. This is the first of many sessions that we are going to do. We plan on having Friday kind of virtual brown bag lunches throughout the year. And I look forward to those. The first one will be chaired by Tri-C and the second one by ODHE. And uh, ODHE will let you know later in the program that they are also uh, sponsoring, if you don't know it already, Transfer Tuesdays, which is another opportunity to bring us together. So let me tell you the areas of questions that we will address today. We have communication and collaboration, which we all know is the crux of uh, operating in this new world. We have admission and outreach strategies, support of transfer students, staffing and reorganization, policies, and finally, and maybe throughout everything, managing our stress, stress, our own and others. So the very first question, and as I have perhaps indicated, communication and collaboration are definitely changed and the crux of effective transfer now and in the future. So the first question will go to Sarah Unger of Miami University. Sarah, how has communication related to transfer functions, such as advising, articulation agreements, credit transfer, financial aid, recruiting, and relationship building, how has that changed in the COVID-19 age, and what do you see as the challenges and benefits of that change? Yeah, so since we're not able to connect with students in person, we've really had to ramp up our communication efforts during this COVID-19 age. Um, so not only can our students now attend virtual information sessions and virtual tours, but we've also, you know, changed our capability to set up one-on-one -on -one video appointments with students. We now have a chat feature on our website so students can connect with us immediately during office hours or leave messages when we're not in the office. Um, we really just wanted to be as high touch as possible in all of our different transfer functions. Um, um, you know, when it comes to challenges, I, I think the biggest challenge really has been moving everything online. Uh, Miami has been so big on like the like come to campus, get that on campus visit experience, but you know, we had to move everything online and we had to do so quickly. Um, and we had never really had much online before. So I think that was really the biggest challenge for us. Um, in terms of benefits, um, Really, it's just been access. Uh, you know, having our students be able to connect with us and you know visit campus virtually has been a huge change. Um, we've seen a lot of positive outcomes from our students and being able to connect with us. Um, and while I hope we can offer on campus you know visits soon, I really also hope that we continue with this virtual online opportunities as well, um, just so we can meet students where they are. Thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate your comments. And it seems that it's been a boon for Miami University. And I think for many of us and for many of our students as well, challenging, but still there have been great benefits in enhancing access to communication. Next question goes to Katie Bradford of Tri-C. What steps are you taking to foster communication and collaboration within and among institutions at Tri-C, Katie? Katie, you're muted. Thank you. I had to wait for Jonathan to unmute me. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> I was just typing a message there. Thanks, Jonathan. All right. So um, thanks for that question, Deb. At Tri-C, um, we have collaborated with our articulation office to um, schedule WebEx update meetings with several of our partner institutions. That was back in April. 
And that was really helpful to be able to hear um, the information firsthand about admission policy changes and then be able to share that information directly with our students as well. So we're actually working on a second round of those um, right now as things continue to change. So we're hoping to connect with even more schools um, in the coming months. And then Tri-C also has web pages for each of our partnership schools. Um, and again, the Articulation Transfer and Prior Learning Office at Tri-C manages those pages and they've been keeping them updated with um, COVID-19 related policy updates from each institution as well. Um, so those are just a couple of examples. Thank you so much, Katie. So the next question goes to Mary Witt of Columbus State. What new relationships have you developed with other institutions or organizations in this time, Mary? Well, I'm by myself usually. So people who've been down to Columbus State, they know it's just me working in the office. So it's not much different, uh, but what I'm doing right now is really for internal wise, uh, I'm just sending out a weekly newsletter to all of the student-facing staff that work with students who may be thinking about transfer. And what I'm trying to do is I uh, started out communicating policies about COVID-19 and the shutdowns and virtual visits and so forth. And what I'm really hoping to do is that newsletter continues to try and highlight programs and uh, degrees and different things that maybe advisors hadn't thought about, uh, just thinking about them differently. So I'm just trying to get the word out since I can't be face to face with everyone. Um, I'm hoping to start meeting with our partners a little more often. It's just been there's no news. So <laughs> there's really not something to say. But one thing Columbus State has done is the uh, live local, learn local. I always say it wrong, so I had to look down. Uh, where we met with uh, some of the our partners that are uh, from the Columbus area to try and encourage Columbus area students in the region that if they weren't feeling uh, positive about their college choices or maybe they just wanted to stay closer to home for either the coming semester or more permanently, that they could stay here in Columbus and there was lots of opportunity for them to learn uh, either online or in person on campus uh, through us through them and with our partnerships that if they felt more comfortable starting with us, you know, maybe for financial reasons or something like that, they could start at Columbus State and we have all these strong partnerships that they wouldn't feel like they were missing out on anything from Otterbein or Capital or Ohio Dominican or any of those places. So that was one initiative that we tried to do and we're going to try and move that through the fall and hopefully uh, keep those up even as we move virtual and I think a lot of us are going to remain virtual through the end of the year so it'll be a big challenge. Thanks. Thank you Mary. The newsletter seems like a great vehicle and of course that outreach to students who are feeling uncomfortable is as well. Thank you for your answer. The next question goes to Donna Gracie of Xavier University. Uh, in a crisis institutions and departments often turn their view inward. Uh, for several reasons. What steps has your university taken to minimize silo behaviors? Sure, uh, thanks Deb. Um, it is all too easy to concentrate on, on what you know best, namely the work in front of you. Uh, personally, I get caught up in getting things done, processing transfer credit, getting equivalencies on student records, monitoring that transfer process, in times of stress, and I'm, I'm certain this applies to many of you as well, I dig in, I work harder, I work longer to be productive because productivity makes sense. Um, it, it, gives, it gives an illusion of control. It is certainly not uh, actually control if you can't keep track of the big picture. When we concentrate on what's right in front of us, we can lose, lose those connections across campus. Um, you miss the forest for the trees, essentially. And it is particularly difficult, I think, with, so, with, with all of us working remotely. You don't have that colleague across the aisle or across the hall or um, in the desk next to you to kind of keep you um, grounded in that, in that big picture. So one thing that Xavier University did early on was they created a task force to combat that tendency to silo. Um, information and decisions flowed through that task force. They had the right people at the table. They had people from across campus and a variety of decisions um, so that they had the comprehensive data that they needed to make good decisions. 
to, um, to prevent that siloing so that a decision that made sense for one division wasn't counterproductive for another division. From my perspective, on the outside looking in, um, decisions were centralized with the flow of information inward and outward, kind of resembling the, the hub and spoke of a wagon wheel. And I think it, it has worked particularly well. Sounds like a brilliant idea and one that Xavier might want to continue once they're back face to face. Yes, I do miss myself that opportunity to bump into people in the hall and uh, get new information, but also just that uh, relationship building that happens in face to face meetings. So uh, thank you for sharing your, your perspective from Xavier. The next that we're going to explore with a couple of questions related to admission outreach strategies. And Sarah here of Miami is going to take this question. At Miami, what changes have you made in outreach to transfer students in general and international students in particular, Sarah? Yeah, so when it comes to outreach, um, we really just wanted to make sure that our students know that we are here to support them during these crazy times. Um, so we've really been checking on our students pretty regularly and just making sure that they're okay, do they have any questions, concerns, anything like that. Flexibility has also been really key during this time. Um, you know, it's important to realize that, you know, students' plans might change as the pandemic changes. Um, and with international students in particular, you know, everything that's going on can mean that they have not been able to get official transcripts to us. You know, maybe they're not able to schedule a visa appointment because everything's still shutting down. Um, we just want to make sure that, you know, they have options available and they know that they have options. Um, and that, you know, even if they're not able to make it to campus this fall, that they're still a part of the Miami community. Um, so we have a lot of different things in the works for the fall for students, regardless of their situation. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, the next question goes to Shaka Wilson of The Ohio State University. Shaka, how have virtual appointments or visit programs been going, especially those in the state? So one of the biggest things that Columbus State students and staff rely on are the visits from OSU admissions and advising. So when it switched all over to online, it took a little time for the message to get out to students and staff of how those visits were still going to happen. OSU had already agreed that they would still continue those visits. So we just had to make sure that we crafted the message correctly and in a time frame to be able to get students and staff to um, be able to take uh, advantage of those visits. So at first it took a little bit of time from my understanding um, with OSU admissions visits, um, but OSU did not stop in their admissions. They continued with their visits. They did it instead of in person. We were doing it once a week. They did the Tuesday, Thursday visits, um, which was very beneficial. And from my understanding, uh, once word got out and students began to understand how to use those visits, that helped. And then also in regards to OSU advising, the advisors who um, who advised more of the, the more popular majors still uh, said that they had pretty decent number of students finishing off spring semester communicating with them. So they used, of course, the formats of email, phone calls, and Zoom. Well, I'm sure that the students have been benefiting from those virtual visits. They probably felt a little bereft when we made this switch. So thank you, Shaka. I want to remind everybody in the audience that uh, I know that you must have questions to these panelists, so remember to put them in chat. Our next area is support of trans students, and this is to Tracy Katie Baffert. How have you at tri transition student support services for trans planning to a fully virtual service, and what changes have you made to your website to provide support? Yeah, so we went fully virtual um, back in March, as everyone else did. Um, there was a lot of email and phone outreach to students towards the beginning of that transition, which I think was really important just to let them know that we're still, that we're still available and still offering services. Um, so right now we're taking appointments with students by phone and WebEx. We're leaving it up to them, whatever their preference is. Um, we've also implemented an online scheduling system, uh, appointment scheduling system, so that students can easily set up their own appointments. It's something that we didn't have before college-wide. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Another big change for us is that our transfer specialists um, are now in Tri-C live chat during all business hours. So that's given us a really great way to be able to connect with students and community members, anyone that's on our website and has questions about transfer. Um, and I'd say this has all been pretty successful. We did some, um, pulled some data on student traffic comparing the spring to last spring, and we were actually up slightly in terms of how many students we were able to serve. So that was some good news. Um, in terms of the website, we did re recently launch a new transfer center website that has multiple pages of student facing student friendly information about planning for transfer. So one thing that we really wanted to highlight on there was lots of contact information, lots of different ways to reach us. Um, again, just really trying to make it as easy as possible for students to continue the transfer planning process. So um, that would be things like the online appointment scheduling, Google voice numbers. And then in addition, we're, we're trying to move some of our paper based processes online, um, still continuing into the summer. Well, it sounds as if you've really improved access. Your traffic has increased and probably students have uh, obviously many more options. So thank you for doing all of that at Tri-C and gives us ideas for what we need to do as well. Donna Grace is going to ask, answer the question about registrar functions. How have these, uh, what changes have you seen in registrar functions during this period, Donna, and do you expect those to continue? Well, well I, would, I, would say, I would say change really is the key word here. Um, ironically, despite the overall university-wide changes for spring 2020, the Office of the Registrar is doing most of our changing for summer and for fall, mainly because decisions were made so quickly uh, at Xavier, and I'm you know really across the state, um, what we did was we extended spring break by one week to give um, students the opportunity to come back to campus, pack their stuff up and head home, and also to give instructors a week um, to change their pedagogy and to figure out how to offer these courses online or, or remote. Um, Xavier's very much a um, in the classroom, hands-on kind of institution, so the, the faculty needed you know, a little bit of grace period to, to make those adjustments. So big changes, but for all that change in the Office of the Registrar, there really wasn't sufficient time or personnel to update the part of term for each class, to change the precise end dates for each class, to update classes from showing as on campus to showing as remote. Um, we did the overall big picture changes. Uh, we changed the web page. But we didn't do the small details that, that registrar folks really thrive on. Uh, for summer and fall, however, we have waded into those details. You know, all of our classes were, were really, uh, a lot of them were already built or in the process of being built. And we took a step back and we adjusted everything to make sure that all of the details were, um, if not completely tidy, a lot tidier than spring. Thank all you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that, that's okay. I, I can continue or are, if you're... Oh, you, please do. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, there was also a certain domino effect in the office. We had to push back the conferral of degrees because the end of the semester was pushed back. We had to push back printing diplomas, fall registration, summer registration. I won't even get into commencement because obviously that was... Um, postponed. Maybe we'll be able to have one. We'll see. Um, like many institutions, we're offering grades of satisfactory and unsatisfactory. But for, from my standpoint, you know, Xavier typically requires a grade of C or better for you to transfer credit into Xavier. And for the first time, we're, we're looking at those grades of S's and P's because in some cases we know students didn't have an, an option or um, if they did, their, you know, their semester was significantly impacted by COVID. So we're looking at those grades for core courses. For major related, you know, there still could be um, some exceptions, but um, we're looking at all of that. Basically, we know what to do. We know how to do our work, but we've had to find different ways to do it from our dining room tables, from our hastily organized home offices, and we've gotten creative. There's been a lot of emails. There's been a lot of scanning of things back and forth. We've gotten flexible. The one thing we are not flexible on is FERPA, 
um, because we are, after all, the registrar's office. Sure, I understand. Well, thank you for reminding us of everything that goes on behind the scenes. Obviously, changes have been required in teaching, in advice, but there's a lot more to it, and we're thankful to you and all of the other registrars in the state for paying attention and uh, probably staying up at night. I know you stayed up at, at night uh, managing those changes. The next area that we're going to deal with are policy changes. First question goes to Sarah Unger. Tell us, Sarah, what new policies or policy changes have been developed at Miami in response to COVID-19? Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, we really do have to be much more flexible. So this means we've done a lot of extending our deadlines for transfer international and even first year students when it comes to applying and even com confirming their enrollment. Um, We've also changed our policies when it comes to transcripts for at least this fall only. Um, you know, some students have had a lot of trouble getting official transcripts to us. Um, so we have, you know, been able to accept unofficial transcripts for a review. As long as, you know, we do get the official one by the starter classes, um, just to be able to kind of take that burden off of students, you know, everything that's going on is Burdenful enough. Um, so just trying to make that process a little smoother. And then once again, for international students, we're really contemplating different scenarios for the fall in case students can't make it to us. Um, we want to make sure that they feel like they are a part of our community, um, whether or not they're physically on campus or having to take online classes, um, which is not something Miami offers a lot of. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, now we have the people who run policy for the state of Ohio related to education. Paula Compton is going to answer the question, what changes, and this is a big area for all of us, what changes made lab-based courses, how might these change the transfer, and what is the need doing related to the support of virtual labs? Dr. Compton? Uh, you're muted, Paula. There. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting us to come and be part of the discussion today. Um, in the Ohio Department of Higher Education office, we were directed by the chancellor to eliminate barriers to help students during these times. And that's what we have been doing and that's what your institutions have been doing. And um, one of the things that we have been trying to do is for all of you to know about policies that have been adjusted during these times. Uh, we have a website on our main uh, website of the Ohio Department of Higher Education that deals with uh, COVID-19 and the policy changes that have been made during these times. And you can find that under articulation and transfer. And uh, one of the areas that we have been dealing with is the fact that many of you know uh, for the public institutions that for the Ohio transfer module that you needed to have uh, in-person lab courses or hybrid courses. And with uh, COVID-19, that was not the situation. And many of the professional uh, natural science organizations also realized that that was going to be a problem. So for this spring term and also for the summer, uh, some of the policies that were in place requiring hybrid lab courses or in-person lab courses were waived. Now into the fall, we realized that based on everything that's happening, we weren't sure what the situation would be. And I'm happy to report that uh, last week, we had five discussion areas uh, with the natural science uh, faculty to talk about virtual labs. And then starting uh, in July, we are gonna continue those discussions. So it really shows the uh, dedication of faculty to provide the best possible education to students. Thank you for leading that collaboration. We certainly appreciate it. 
The next question also goes to Dr. Compton. Tell us about the changes that are being made to the Ohio Transfer Module TAG courses and the Guaranteed Transfer Pathways, and how might these changes support transfer? Well, before COVID-19 hit, uh, we were already at working on possible changes to the Ohio Transfer Module. I think for the last two to three years, we've been, we've been studying gen ed uh, principles and how they need to be updated for the 21st uh, century. And I know Jesse now will report to you on what we've been doing. Thank you, Paula. Um, so a lot's been done right now. Um, currently, we Many of you might be um, a part of some of our panels, our advisory council, or OTM faculty sub-panel committee members. Um, we we um, acknowledge um, a model that uh, focuses on possible revisions. Um, so this model describes um, our, current, uh, our current model, um, speaking of 36 hours. Um, right now, um, the potential changes do not reflect uh, any significant changes, um, housing the original 24 hours of um, current OTM five discipline areas, and then the 12 elective hours, um, where the potential change does um, arise is within those 12 elective hours. Um, so right now within um, uh, our changes include breakout of those 12 hours, really focusing on um, the decided or undecided students. Um, the decided students uh, kind of will focus on some of those OTM electives uh, geared towards the Ohio Guaranteed Transfer Pathways. And then the undecided students will then further be broken down into um, AS or AA degrees. Um, and depending on their area specification or interest, um, they'll focus on, um, you know, the mathematics, natural sciences, or those arts and humanities and social behavioral sciences. Um, so again, with those 24 um, staying the um, OTM courses, in addition to those 12 elective OTM courses, we'll keep the current model at that 36 hours. Um, so again, those changes have been um, I guess, discussed with multiple uh, groups within the state. Um, we're continuing that work and further announcements will be made uh, once kind of concluding. Um, in addition, we're also having um, some discussions focusing around uh, diversity. Um, so uh, where, where will that be uh, within the OTM? Um, will it be a standalone course? Um, learning outcomes and um, one of our current or multiple current OTM um, uh, discipline areas. Um, so those discussions are taking place. We have a smaller uh, diversity group um, working on learning outcomes and um, uh, this past fall we had a nomination survey for um, those that are interested in serving on that diversity group. Um, we had over 90 nominations come, come back. So once that smaller group uh, works to develop those learning outcomes, again, focusing around diversity, we'll take those to the larger statewide group and um, see what individuals think. It's a very important topic, especially within um, uh, our country nationally and globally. So we're really excited to kind of see how it uh, progresses. Thank you so much, Jesse. Jared, I wonder if you might want to comment at this point about any policy changes, any support service changes that have been made related to our veterans and supporting those veterans who are transferring. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there could really be probably a whole hour presentation on just this alone. Um, just to give a quick heads up, there has been numerous legislation at the federal level since March just to help with a lot of factors of the GI Bill. Um, if you need to learn more about that, um, you can get in contact with me after this or shoot me an email because there's, again, there's a lot of details with that. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of the support services things that the institutions are doing. Um, it's not necessarily dramatically different from what they were already doing, but I think they've amped it up with a little bit more of the online um, feel, obviously, that we have to. Um, I know Wright State and um, Wright State University and Kent State University have unveiled kind of new web pages that have um, sort of uh, checklists and everything to deal with military uh, admissions into their institutions um, and whatnot. So it gives them a really clear layout of what they need to do and how to get everything in order and get their finances in order and things like that. Um, Youngstown State has been uh, essentially trying to get more students to identify themselves as veterans because I think that's a problem for everybody too if they're not using benefits getting them to ID. Um, so they're kind of emailing out and letting students know that they have um, 
basically they're doing scholarships, like all the services that their office has available, math tutoring, English tutoring, um, obviously transcript evaluation for military credit. Um, they have the veterans group and they have their center. Uh, typically that's all stuff that they sort of uh, had done in the past at their physical center location, but obviously now they're trying to move that into the virtual uh, environment as well. Um, another uh, relatively new thing too is uh, University of Toledo. Uh, within the last year, they've kind of started a uh, what's well, PAVE program. It's a peer advising um, for veterans uh, organization. We've got a few institutions in the state that are participating in that, and I think we've got some that are doing pretty similar work, but it's not the official same program. Um, but that's actually a peer advisor gets assigned to the student at UT when they show up, and it basically helps them do everything they need to do. Um, it's interesting because that's that's something that often happens when you join the military and you come to a new base. You have what the military calls a sponsor that helps you out with a lot of things. Um, so they're doing that and they've actually done it as a opt out service. So every student uh, veteran that's coming to them um, is automatically opted into that and they have to do it. And then they have to actually specifically opt out to not participate. Um, and even though it's been almost a year, they've said that they actually haven't had any students opt out of that service. So that's actually been really neat. Um, I know a few schools that have done that and some of that have sort of struggled off and on with getting people to help. Um, and UT, I think, is the first one that's done it as an opt-out, and that seems to have worked the best so far. Um, the other item I'll mention is um, Bowling Green. Um, they've sent out a lot of automated messages from their um, veterans office um, when students, when new veteran students are applying. Um, when they register, they get an automated message as well about what's going on. Um, they have a peer support program as well through PAVE there at Bowling Green. Um, but something they've also done on top for um, related to COVID-19, um, there was a lot of issues uh, without going into tons of details about students dropping out of courses and that affecting your GI Bill payments. Um, they actually were able to somehow monitor behind the scenes um, all the veteran students and if they had actually logged into any of their online courses. So they were able to reach out to any student veteran on campus who had not logged in to a course to basically touch base to see what was going on. Uh, after they did that, they actually called the entire student veteran population um, just to check in and see how they were doing. Um, and then for those students who selected to do some type of a grade change, like a pass fail um, satisfactory type change from a letter grade, um, they actually contacted all those individually as well to tell them basically the pros and cons of how that could affect things uh, for their future uh, at Bowling Green. Um, so those are some of the responses I've got from all the schools. I mean, I've, I, overall, I've heard very positive things going on uh, in the veteran community. Early March, it was very much up in the air with everything in the GI Bill and not knowing if federal legislation was going to pass for this and that. Um, things have definitely calmed down quite a bit. I think we're getting into a pretty good groove. So um, I guess that's it for me. Thank you so much, Jared, for sharing all of the work that you do, but as well the work of the institutions to make the transfer experience and just experience on campus better for our veterans. So thank you. Uh, we are running out of time for our panelists, but I don't want to skip the managing stress section. So just going to ask the panelists to be curious in answering these questions. Sarah, how are you dealing with the stress of students and coworkers at Miami? Hi, I wasn't unmuted. Um, so for, like I said, flexibility and understanding for students, um, but for our coworkers, we've done a lot of just touching base with one another. Um, not only do we have team meetings and overall team meeting and our individual team meetings every week, but we have something called Slack, which is like a chat feature for um, all of Miami employees. Um, and with chat, Slack, you have channels. Um, we've created an admission just for fun channel where every week we have some kind of theme. Um, so it's been really fun to see like coworkers post pictures from like prom or vacations or even just kind of learning, you know, what they've been doing over quarantine. Um, it's just something to kind of break it up a little bit and gives us all something to look forward to every week. Um, we typically post on Thursdays. So always something knowing that on Thursday, there's going to be a bunch of things to look at. Thank you. I love that idea of the just for fun. And that's certainly something you might continue. Katie, what kinds of self care techniques have you personally adopted? Yeah, so something that I find really helpful is trying to keep somewhat of a physical separation. 
um, between my workspace and my living space as much as that's possible. I know we're all sort of living in our offices right now. <clears throat> um, and I'm also spending a lot of my personal time right now reading and reflecting on what's happening and trying to learn more about the injustices in our country, especially as it relates to higher ed. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I didn't comment previously when um, Jesse was sharing about the diversity panel, but that's certainly, certainly well-timed considering the events of the last two weeks. Uh, Shaka, tell me what benefits you've seen personally and professionally in this time, and what would, should we all remember to be grateful for? Shaka, you're muted. There. Sorry. <laughs> so some of the benefits that I um, have gained through this time is that I've definitely been pushed to increase my technology skills and strengthen um, those both personally and professionally. And I've also had the opportunity to get a lot more invitations to professional development at little to no cost, um, if there was any cost. And then... Um, Basically, to address um, what we should be grateful for, or what I'm grateful for, I'd have to say that at a time when our state and our country is facing a historic unemployment rate and, of course, the health crisis that is affecting us all, either directly or indirectly, I am definitely thankful for my health, um, uh, my increased unapologetic time with my family, of course, remaining employed, and then lastly, having a supportive and flexible team um, and, of course, compassionate leadership that I have experienced with Ohio State. Thank you so much, Shaka. I am personally grateful, particularly today, for the collaboration that OGC uh, provides and the panelists' contributions. I am going to silence myself and turn this over to Jonathan and help field some of the questions that were Hello, everyone. Um, if you can hear me, that's great. We actually just had a couple of questions that came through uh, while you guys were talking. I feel like you guys covered a lot, so thank you for all of your expertise. Um, the first one comes from Krista, which this was a question for all of the panelists, but I feel like there are a couple that are uh, mostly uh, in like the transfer recruiting area. So I'm actually going to lean on uh, Sarah Unger for her um, for her expertise once again. Uh, but uh, her question was uh, regarding uh, our campus is gonna have in-person classes this fall. Um, I would like uh, multiple people to answer this, so I'm gonna ask a couple of people to, un uh, to unmute themselves, but I will um, you know, bring it up afterwards. So I'm gonna start with Sarah. Sure, so Miami is fully planning on having classes this fall, but that being said, we're also listening to leadership um, in our state government. Um, so while I can't 100% guarantee, it's highly hopeful that we are going to be on campus this fall. Um, but as you all know, things could change very quickly. Um, so we're just kind of making sure that we're preparing for all scenarios. Um, and we actually have a whole committee at the university that is dedicated to kind of, you know, moving us all back on campus, both employees as well as students um, safely. Perfect. Um, I am now going to ask kind of the same thing to Donna. Um, as far as fall, yes, Xavier is planning on being open in the fall. We are um, working towards that, and as you might imagine, there's there's a lot of questions. You know, we we will rely on the CDC, we will rely on um, the state of Ohio for for the guidance, and if um, if social distancing continues, then we have to look at how do we manage having classes um, and social distance. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of questions happening and a lot of um, plan A, plan B, plan C, um, because some of our decisions really won't depend on our decisions. They will depend on what we hear from the state and if there's a second wave. Um, so we're doing a lot of planning and preparing. Yeah, that is great. Um, I am now going to uh, ask Katie to give it from the Tri-C perspective. Sure, um, so we are still kind of awaiting an official announcement, I think, um, 
Tri-C has adopted a phased approach in terms of the reopening. Um, and actually this week, phase one started, which was the reopening of some of our campus facilities on a very limited basis. Um, again, like others are saying, you know, following our leadership is making sure that we're following all the guidelines. Um, so we are now having just a few in-person services available to students in terms of enrollment centers and libraries and the sort, um, but definitely adhering to social distancing and, and all those measures. Um, in terms of fall, still waiting for the official announcement. I think the college is considering offering a variety of options uh, for students, so more to come soon. All right, perfect, thank you. Um, so our second and final question actually comes from Dave Sauter. Um, so he is asking, um, he, he wrote a lot, so when we release this later, you get to see this, uh, the whole thing, but um, he's asking, is it kind of like, a, is there a change in transfer numbers coming in right now? Um, we know he's a registrar man, so he, um, you know, is talking about tracking outgoing transcript orders uh, might help indicate, uh, you know, those students transferring out. So I'm actually going to lean on Donna again first to kind of give us our, her perspective to see you know, she's seeing like a large influx of going out. I know she's more or less on the credit posting side, but she might have uh, some, some insight for that. And then we'll ask some people in some other capacities after that. So Donna, could you give us some information on that? A little bit. Um, I can say that our retention numbers are good. So to me, that means there's not a significant number of students transferring out. Um, as you said, I do mainly focus on the incoming transfer credit. So you know, I'm kind of in the thick of freshmen who have dual enrollment and, um, and students who, who either had planned to transfer, you know, they've started at a two-year institution and they're, and they're planning on transferring, or in some cases, there's, there's students who perhaps were further away from home and now want to be a little, a little closer to home. I, I don't have exact numbers, um, mainly because transfer students, as we all know, um, they, they make their decisions when they make their decisions. So sure. um, we, we're getting those equivalencies ready for them as quickly as we possibly can. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm actually going to go with the uh, Columbus State OSU approach since we have Mary Witt and Chaka here. Have you guys been noticing like a difference in traction when it comes to people coming through the fun or that specific funnel I know that Mary can kind of speak a little bit more broadly when it just comes to uh, people transferring out of Columbus State, but have you guys seen a slow with those students? Uh, do you, if you have, are you expecting to see more of like a ramp up towards the end of summer? Um, any insight on that would be great. Um, well, I mean, the only thing I've ever really had to judge was when OSU extends their, and there's OSU people on here and I feel really bad for speaking on behalf. But in my mind, it's always when they extend the admissions deadline, um, like that kind of says, okay, they need more or less. So they did extend their deadline from May 1st to June 1st. And I feel like at least I got a lot more questions uh, from students asking how to process transcripts and go up there. So I think that extension helps people because I think some people just weren't ready to pull the trigger. Um, personally, I think uh, some students, uh, anecdotally we're kind of waiting to see what OSU was going to do uh, mm -hmm. too but now that they've made a decision to go back to campus that may you may see some students you know finally sending in or trying to extend in those acceptances and pay those fees and get started um, and then definitely you know putting their uh, application in for uh, spring if everything goes okay I would imagine the the faucet will turn back on, but I'll let Chaka weigh in too. Um, I don't really know too much regarding the admission piece of it. I can just go from what I've heard from our, my, the groups of students that I've worked with. Um, I, from my understanding, the, the numbers were low and for admissions to OSU in regards to transfer students. I did have some students who were hesitant in that transfer once they learned that OSU was going to be all virtual summer. So... <laughs> they they hesitated um so we'll see now that they have announced that they will be going um back to class in autumn uh, but the students that are transferring that i that i work with um closely they're still actually excited 
and uh, about the transfer, whether or not it was online. They, I don't know if they cared one way or another. They're just excited about transferring from Columbus State to Ohio State and have been prepared and actually have been thriving both virtually and in class. So a lot of them, a lot of them uh, were successful in that spring semester at the end. So they just kind of have a lot of hope. And I have hope for them as well. Yeah, great. Thank you, guys. Um, actually, we got another question in while you guys were talking. It is, again, from Dave. Um, he was, uh, he has seen some things with like academic calendars that are coming out and uh, even bringing up the point that some institutions are um, like, they'll go on Thanksgiving break and they'll actually then do uh, the rest of their semester online um, and they might take shorter or take shorter term, which involves uh, change in federal regulations and longer class times. Um, he's mostly asking are uh, people uh, looking at calendar changes, I know that uh, us at Kent State, we got some sort of, uh, you know, something earlier uh, this week saying that um, our students, they're, they're kind of planning on having them go home for Thanksgiving and then finishing out their semester uh, from home. But um, I'm going to unmute a couple of you guys. And if like Donna or Sarah want to elaborate on, you know, like what's going on with your uh, academic calendars, is there any insight yet, or have you guys heard of anything like that so far? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, there's certainly a lot of a lot of discussion, and I can't tell you that the that the final final decision is made. Um, but I, I know we are looking to push up the start of the semester. So we'll start a little bit early. Um, I think in all likelihood we will adjust our, um, our fall break so that instead of students having um, a, a long weekend where they're likely to go somewhere, be exposed to a whole lot of uh, potential COVID-19 and what have you, um, you know, they, we would do a, s a smaller, maybe midweek break. Um, and likely after students go home for Thanksgiving, they would not return to campus. That way there's not a lot of back and forth. Um, mm -hmm. Students could finish out uh, their exams and you know, whatever final bits of instruction might happen. Uh, they would do that little bit remote and we would end our semester a little early. Again, I don't have the exact um, dates A, firmly in mind, and B, uh, can I tell you that there won't be a, a change between now and then, but that's, that's what we're looking at. That's what I'm seeing when I look at um, um, chat features that come through with OACAC and the, um, the other Jesuit colleges and universities. Okay, I'm gonna ask the same thing to Sarah. Yeah, so we haven't, to my knowledge, made any final decisions. Um, like I said, that committee just started meeting regularly a couple weeks ago for kind of the reopening up of the university. So we're not really sure what it's going to look like yet. I know um, they are looking at multiple scenarios. They want to make sure, like I said, that it's completely safe for students. Um, so we're not sure what direction that they're going to go in. Okay, sounds great. I think that a lot of us are in that, that weird limbo period. So um, that is great. Thank you to our panelists for all of these, you know, great answers to these questions. Um, we are now going, going to go into the final phase. So um, I would ask that everyone would turn off their mic and their video and uh, we'll hear from Ted McCown. All right, well, thank you, Deb, and uh, for moderating that wonderful session, and for all of our panelists who have participated, and uh, also to Jonathan for doing the behind the scenes and, and moderating today's session. It was a thought-provoking dialogue. We really appreciate it. It's my honor now to conclude uh, today's first ever virtual annual meeting of the Ohio Transfer Council. And I uh, just have a few items. Uh, and. I begin by presenting the President's Award. The President's Award is uh, given to our outgoing president every year, and this year's award recipient never imagined what she would have to navigate uh, as the leader of our organization. During a very difficult time, particularly this past spring, um, this leader was able to continue to move forward uh, the goals of our organization 
while also navigating a new world uh, for herself professionally, working virtually. Her leadership has inspired me and all of us to think in new ways and inspired us to work together remotely. And this year's President's Award recipient is Donna Geraci. Donna, I, I thank you so much for your mentorship and for your leadership and your passion for students and your passion for OTC. You've kept us going and uh, I look forward to working with you throughout this next year. And right now there would be a standing ovation for you and much applause. Next are the scholarships. Uh, each year, the David Gall Memorial Scholarship is awarded to transfer students within our transfer um, members and our, our member institutions. And so the David Gall Memorial Scholarship is named for David Gall, who worked with transfer students at Ohio State and was one of the early members of OTC and was very involved in what was then known as the North Council and the South Council back when OTC was formed. He was a tireless advocate for transfer students and in honor of David and his work with the Ohio Transfer Council, each year OTC awards multiple $1,000 scholarships for students that transfer from one member institution to another. The 2019 scholarship recipients were Micah Swartz, who transferred from Lorain County Community College to the University of Toledo. Monica Stevenson, who transferred from Cuyahoga Community College to Ohio State University. Daylin Bever, who transferred from the University of Akron to Kent State University. Anna Jesse Taylor, who transferred from the University of Miami to the University of Cincinnati, and Gabrielle Post, who transferred from Lorain County Community College to Ursuline College. The 2020 David Gall Memorial Scholarship application is now open and available on the OTC website. Scholarships will be accepted through June 30th, so please um, make that available to your students, and we look forward to reviewing all of the scholarships coming in throughout the summer later. Next, I wanna just mention upcoming professional development opportunities. First of all, remember that uh, your OTC membership has been extended for uh, throughout the next year. Also, new members can join for free uh, this upcoming year. So please encourage others that you know that work with transfer students to join and they'll be able to participate in any of our online sessions that, that we're having um, for, for free. We are planning to provide monthly online sessions and our next online session is July 17th, which will be a best practices guide. And uh, some of our constituents at Cuyahoga Community College will be presenting that session. And then on August 7th, we will also have an update session with ODHE, led by Paula Compton. In closing, I wanna thank everyone for attending today and, and remind you of Amy Acton's words during this challenging time. Dr. Acton, who's Ohio's top doctor, recently stated that, I'm not afraid, I'm determined. And during this time of societal challenges, let us all be determined to support one another within our organization so that together, we can comfort and inspire our students who are normally going through transitions in just a regular world. Let us work together so that we as organizations and the OTC can challenge those whom we serve to never give up and always seek to grow and reach their dreams and goals. Let us together be determined to make this, this year the best year in our profession we have ever experienced not fearing change, but embracing the opportunity to think differently. Thank you for coming today. Enjoy your summer. And we look forward to seeing you in July at our next online session. Thank you so much for attending.